everything goes wireless these days. This is why we have a close look at the black magic of antennas, how they work, what is essential and how to test them. Based on this knowledge, we will build a cheap antenna tester for LoRa antennas. The same principle can be used to test Wi-Fi antennas. Grüezi YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent with a new episode around sensors and microcontrollers. Wireless systems, as the name says, have no wires to connect the sender to the receiver. They use air instead. Strange, because as we all know, air is a very good isolator and does not conduct electricity. This is why we have to use radio frequencies instead. Radio waves travel through the air without problems, even in space where there is no air at all. But they are quickly stopped by all kinds of materials. This is why the line of sight is so essential for this technology. A wireless system looks like that. We have a microchip which wants to communicate with another microprocessor. Instead of wires, it uses wireless. So we have to add a sender, an antenna, the space between the two antennas, a second antenna and a receiver to replace the wire. You see, this system is way more complicated than just using a cheap cable. Fortunately, these days the components are inexpensive and straightforward to use. Except for antennas, perhaps. They are not easy. If we added an antenna to the I.O. pins of our Arduino, nothing would happen, because such low frequencies do not radiate into the air efficiently. We have to use much higher frequencies, like, in the case of LoRa in Europe, 868 MHz. Therefore, the sender packs the information onto a carrier on a high frequency. This is called modulation. The signal with a particular power then travels via an antenna cable to the sending antenna and radiates to the environment and travels towards the receiving antenna. The receiving antenna picks up what is left from this power and feeds it to the receiver, also via a cable. And the receiver filters the relevant signal, demodulates the content and supplies it to the microcontroller. The whole link only works if the receiver gets enough power from the transmitted signal. A sender produces power. How much usually depends on three things. First, the purpose of the wireless link, its planned reach and its planned capacity. Second, the law. Because air is a shared area, strict rules exist on how to use it. And third, the energy available in the sending device especially if battery powered. For this video, I assume the purpose of our system is transmission of data. It could also be the transmission of voice or TV signals. For Wi-Fi and LoRa, we use so-called ISM bands for our carriers. Everybody is allowed to use these bands free of charge without a license. But the power of our senders is very limited. LoRa modules only produce 100 milliwatt or 20 dBm of power. As a comparison, as a licensed amateur radio operator, I'm allowed to use 1 kilowatt or 60 dBm on some frequencies, which is 10,000 times more. And even if we would be allowed to use higher power, we often do not want because our devices should run on batteries. You see, we have to pay attention that we do not lose power. Already before, you heard the word DBM. In antenna lingo, you will often hear DBM or DBI. What is the meaning? DB or decibel is a logarithmic proportion. It has the nice feature that we can add DB instead of multiplying the values. DBM or DB milliwatts is used to measure power. Here is a table which shows milliwatts and DBM. Let's do an example. Your sender emits 20 dBm, which is 100 milliwatts, and your antenna cable has a loss of 10 dB. Your power at the end of the antenna cable will be 20 dBm minus 10 dB equals 10 dBm, which is only 10 milliwatt. The 90 milliwatt heat our antenna cable and our sender chip will still use the same amount of battery energy. Apparently, the question, 
Where can we lose our win power is essential. Yes, you heard right. We can win power in this game. Or a sort of. We will see later how. Unfortunately, it is much easier to lose it. As we saw before, the first place to lose power is in the cable from the transmitter to the antenna. If we use 3 meters of RG174 cable on 868 MHz, we already lose 3 dB or 50% of our power before our signal reaches the antenna. The cables delivered with our China antennas usually are thinner and of less quality. This is how a good coax cable looks. But they are costly, thick and stiff. The first rule therefore is use short, high quality and thick antenna cables. The antenna has to radiate the power into the space around it. Antennas only work right on one frequency, its resonance frequency. In general, the longer an antenna, the lower their resonance frequency. A future video will cover how we adjust antennas to the right frequency. For today, a good antenna transmits all power into the air. A lousy antenna reflects a lot of the power back to the sender. This power again is lost. The ratio between total and reflected power often is called standing wave ratio, abbreviated SWR or VSWR. It is a number between 1 and infinite. Here is the table. Rule number 2. An SWR below 2 is acceptable and means that less than 11% of power is reflected and therefore lost for our primary purpose. A word of caution. If you do not connect an antenna to your sender, 100% of the power is reflected back to the sender and heats it up. This can quickly destroy your small chips. Rule number 3. Always connect an antenna to the sender. Now the waves travel through space. Here the power is reduced with distance. If the distance doubles, the power is quartered. It is quite evident that the power is not only sent into the direction of the receiving antenna. No, it is sent in all directions. You see, most of it is lost for our receiver, because it never reaches its antenna. And here we have a chance to win power if we manage to build antennas which do not radiate evenly in all directions. They usually use some reflector to reflect the power sent into the opposite direction towards the receiver. This gain is also measured in dBi. dBi is the gain of our antenna over an ideal antenna which evenly radiates in all directions. 3 dB antenna gain has the same effect as a doubling of the power of the sender. If your antenna has a gain of 13 dBi as this one, your sender power is multiplied by a factor of 20 in the direction of your receiver, without needing more power from your battery. Cool! It is not clear to me if such antennas are allowed on the ISM bands if we run our senders on max power. If we reduce the output power, it should be ok. Another important thing you have to know about antennas is polarization. If both antennas are vertically or horizontally oriented, everything is ok. If the two have different polarization, you lose power. Rule number 4. Keep the polarization of your antennas the same way if possible. Also circular polarization exists but it is only used in particular cases like FPV. Rule number 5. The more dBi, the more directionality of the antenna and the more power in one direction. We saw that 3 meters of RG174 cable lost 3 dB. How does air compare to that? I use a simulation tool for this calculation. As a simple example, we start with a distance of 87 km between sender and receiver. The received power is minus 130 dBm. How much do we have to increase the range to get a comparable 3 dB loss? At a distance of 123 km we get minus 133 dBm, 3 dB less. So 3 meters of coax cable has the same loss as 36 km in space. Impressive. This is the reason why our small signals travel long distances, if we have a line of sight. 
You could watch my 200 km LoRaWAN world record video or read about the 700 km where the sender was placed in a balloon. The receiving side behaves precisely the same way. A poorly matched antenna or a thin and long cable reduce the already small signal. Our receivers measure the signal level of the received signal. It is called Received Signal Strength Indicator or RSSI. Usually this is a negative number which gets smaller if the signal is weaker. Because our receiver needs a minimal power or RSSI to demodulate the signal, all the effects discussed add up to the so-called link budget. According to the documentation, LoRa should have a link budget of 150 dB, which is good for about 1000 km with a standard antenna. Rule number 6. If we do a proper antenna setup, the distance in air is not an issue, if we have a line of sight. Theoretically, we covered now everything necessary to do a proper setup. But how can you distinguish between a bad and a good antenna? Is bigger really better? First, we have to look at how much power enters the antenna, because if it does not come to the antenna, it will not be radiated. As I showed in earlier videos, you can use a spectrum analyzer to measure the loss of your cable or the return loss of your antenna. Unfortunately, these are expensive devices. And even then, it is only under laboratory conditions, which can be very different to reality. In Amsterdam, I met a fascinating guy called Stuart. He did a lot of research in antennas for his small satellite, which was successfully launched. He gave me the idea to use reality to test our antennas. And the reality is free of charge and accurate. What was his proposal? To use one of our LoRa boards as a sender and one as a receiver and place them at a distance. We start with whatever antennas on the sender and the receiver and read the RSSI on the receiver side. As we learned before, the RSSI displays the power which reached the receiver. Therefore, this RSSI includes all effects on the transmitter side like cable and antenna as well as the antenna and the cable on the receiver side. To compare another antenna with the one we currently use, we make a note of the RSSI, leave everything the same and only change the sending antenna. Now the RSSI should show us the difference between the two setups. Let's assume we start with sender antenna number 1 and get an RSSI of minus 60. Then we change to antenna 2 and get an RSSI of minus 63. Then we know that antenna 2 is 3 RSSI worse than antenna 1. And because the RSSI is also measured in dB, we know that antenna 1 is 3 dB better than antenna 2, without spending a lot of money. I did some measurements in the lab to confirm that the RSSI reading is exact. It works fine. Next, we tested the concept in reality. As you can see, it was still winter here and my partner had to dress up like an Eskimo. But we were able to prove that the concept did not only work in the UK, but also in Switzerland. You should know that I liked the RF part of Stuart's concept a lot, but not the part that I or my partner had to run forth and back between the sender and the receiver to exchange the RSSI readings. So I added a return channel to the devices. The sender now transmits a JSON string with its used power level to the receiver. The receiver adds the RSSI and sends the string back to the sender. In a later phase, both will get a GPS receiver to calculate the distance. Because the JSON string includes the sending power and the RSSI, the ESP32 on the sending side can calculate the link budget and display it. If we zero the first antenna, we get a reading of minus 3 for the second one, without running forth and back, and in real time. This is precisely how I like it. Of course, we average 5 measurements to get a bit more precision. We Swiss cannot otherwise. Because the weather is better now, we do not need to dress up for our tests. And our devices are also dressed in cute boxes. We placed the receiver on a pole about 100 meters away and the sender on this wood stick. 
If we start the test by pressing a button, the sender waits till we get out of its proximity, beeps and does its thing. Then it beeps again and we can check the result. Humans around antennas are not suitable for measurements. For our first test we use a tuned 868 MHz antenna and press the zero button. This is now the reference. I will show you in a later video how I did this tuning. Next we use a second antenna which looks very similar. We measure minus 2.2 dB. This is the proof that a proper antenna calibration can help. The next antenna is built or more precisely printed by me. It is called Moxon antenna and should have some gain and therefore also a directivity. Let's check. I direct it towards the receiver and measure 5.2 dB compared to our reference. If I turn the antenna in the opposite direction, the reading is minus 3 dB, exactly as expected. For clarification, I reduced the transmitter power for these tests to respect the law. Next I use a longer antenna to check the rule of thumb, longer is better. Unfortunately, the performance of this long antenna is much lower than the one of the short, as you see in the table. Next we measure this tiny antenna which was used for my world record. It shows minus 0.6 dB. We can consider it the same as the reference. And now as a courtesy for my friend Richard. A ground plane without plane compared with a real ground plane with four radials. The ground plane without ground was at minus 2.2 and the ground plane with the ground was at plus 1.4, a difference of about 3 dB. Summarized we discovered seven rules. Rule number one, use short, high quality and thick antenna cables. Rule number two, an SWR below two is acceptable and means less than 11% power is reflected and therefore lost for our primary purpose. Rule number three, always connect an antenna to the sender. Rule number four, keep the polarization of your antennas the same way if possible. Rule number five, the more DBI, the more directionality of the antenna and the more power in one direction. Rule number six, if we do a proper antenna setup, the distance in air is no issue if we have a line of sight. And rule number seven, longer is not always better, smarter is better. As said in one of the next videos, I will introduce you to the world of vector network analyzers and show you how you can optimize your antennas. It will not be as cheap as it was today, but also not as expensive as you might think. Stay tuned. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. You find the links in the description. Thank you. Bye.